I'm Mike Gilliam in the CUNY TV studios in the shadow of the Empire State Building in New York City. Welcome to Let It Rip. Hate and guns, two topics that appear to be intertwined these days with deadly results. But why? What's behind the mass shootings that seem to happen every week in our country? Why are things like the Charlottesville rally and the subsequent death of Heather Heyer at the hands of a white supremacist happening? And what would cause white men to march through the streets, chanting, Jews will not replace us? Here to help us better understand what's driving the hate and the killing, we have two guests. Silanette Duran is an adjunct professor at John Jay College and co-author of Addressing the Myths of Terrorism in America. And we're also joined by human rights attorney and community activist, Roger Wareham. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. It seems we have a mass shooting in the United States almost every week, and often the shooter is targeting a particular group, whether it be immigrants or people of color. Now, is this a form of terrorism? Well, I, in my opinion, I would say yes, especially if we're looking at these perspectives where if we're trying, we're seeing issues of intentionally targeting an entire group. How is that any different from if we were to look at this from the perspective of the Holocaust, where there that was an intentional target of the Jewish people? If we were looking at this in terms of how we would look at state-sponsored terrorism, Vietnam, for example. So how is this any different if I am going out there and intentionally targeting an entire group on the sole basis of, I hate you because of what you look like, because of what you represent, because you threaten white supremacy, then absolutely that's terrorism. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that, Roger? I, I agree wholeheartedly with her. I, th- I think that if the acts that were committed were done by someone of color, uh, there would be no question in, in terms of how it was prosecuted, how it was arrested, how it was prosecuted, and how it was portrayed in the media would be, you know, it's, it's the basis for which the the FBI created a make-believe category of black identity extremists, people who are talking about defending themselves, protecting themselves because they've come under attack because they're black, are now being designated as if they were the perpetrators, as if they were the aggressors. So I agree completely with Selenet's um, analysis. Mm -hmm. There's a nasty uh, undercurrent out there. I want to play a clip here from back during the Charlottesville rally days. This is going to be uh, former KKK head David Duke. Let's listen to this, and we'll talk about it on the other side. This represents a turning point for the people of this country. We are determined to take our country back. We're going to fulfill the promises of Donald Trump. That's what we believed in. That's why we voted for Donald Trump, because he said he's going to take our country back, and that's what we got to do. Now, a lot of people have said that President Trump has emboldened these people. What do you guys think about that? I think from the inception of his campaign, you know, make America great again. You know, we were out in the street talking about that. We're saying when he's talking about make America great again, he's talking about taking America back to a hundred years ago when white supremacy was unquestioned, uh, when uh, black people and brown people knew their place, quote unquote, knew their place. He's talking about taking back to a time uh, when they there was no question of their control of the country. It makes me think about one of the comments that he made uh, directly after the Charlottesville incident where Heather Heyer was killed and people were up in arms over what went on there. Let's listen to him talk about Charlottesville. You, you had a group on one side that was bad and you had a group on the other side that was also very violent. And nobody wants to say that, but I'll say it right now. You had a group, you had a group on the other side that came charging in without a permit, and they were very, very violent. But not all of those people were neo-Nazis, believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. Those people were also there because they wanted to protest the taking down of a statue, Robert E. Lee. Um, let's talk about terrorism and what it actually looks like um, and what your research says about that. 
So in our paper addressing the myths of terrorism, one of the colloquial myths that we looked at was this idea that post 9-11, the national rhetoric was that terrorism was predominantly Muslim, that it was perpetrated by foreign actors. In our research, we found that overwhelmingly, almost 90 percent of domestic terrorism in the United States for the last 27 years has been committed by white actors, predominantly white males of national origin. So they are born here. They are American citizens. It is very rarely does it occur from this idea of uh, the black identity extremists or jihadists as we have uh, as we have coined them um, only about 18 percent of perpetrators were actually jihadist extremists um, a lot of that has to do with the way that the media generates these instances so we over sensationalize these black swan events uh, something like 9-11 something like the pulse nightclub shooting uh, something even like timothy mcveigh these are events that are so rare few and far between, but because if it bleeds, it leads, that's all you see coming across your screen. So if I'm living in Nebraska and CNN is showing me the uh, the San Bernardino shooters over and over and over again, that's all I'm going to see. So now Donald Trump, in his rhetoric, we see him, we saw him with the Muslim ban. He was, what, three, four days in office, maybe? when right. he decided to do this travel ban based on data that I have no idea where the administration got that from, that this is where the majority of terrorism was coming from, when really the ban should have been in the heartland of America. This is where this is where it's coming from. So if you want to talk about a travel ban, you need to look at yourself and you need to look at your own constituents to see what's going on there. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this, though, and what's actually going on with these far right people. What is it that they are so bitter about? Well, obviously, they are now in a in a state where they feel that white identity, white supremacy is in danger. And they are so afraid to let go of the foothold that they have had. And this ironic ideal of we're taking the country back, uh, which uh, you brought up is, is a silly argument because it was never yours to begin with. So you're sitting here crying over property or an identity that you feel belongs to you when the fact is you stole this from the indigenous people and not just stole it, you massacred an entire people to be able to, for you to have something that you claim is now yours. Uh, we see this, we saw this a lot in the manifesto for the El Paso shooting, where everything is based on bringing America back to the righteousness or the greatness of white supremacy. And I always find it funny when I come across and people say, well, this is not what America is about. <laughs> oh, 100 percent. This is what America was built on. Mm -hmm. We came here and we forcibly took land that was already inhabited and then we killed the inhabitants. So now we're saying, oh, you know, I'm here. But so how do you combat that? Well, that's what? the thing. It's hard to. You can't. Yeah, I, I think shows like this I mean I think we they stand reality on its head and they they you know when they say well, this is not what America's about it's precisely what America's about the genocide against indigenous people uh, enslavement of African human beings development of an ideology racism and white supremacy which is predicated on the belief that uh, black people are inferior and that white people are innately a superior and when that begins to be challenged because that's that's the foothold in terms of how do you maintain a system of capitalism that is is predicated on a very small people owning and controlling all of the resources and wealth is that you divide the people who naturally have should have a uh, a common goal and so that's why this continues like in in 2019 we're finding that because Despite what's happening on this, in the stock exchange, the conditions of life of people are, are, are worsening. I, I remember one thing that uh, the president said. He used scare politics during his run, and he would say, this is your last chance, mm -hmm. America, to get this done, mm -hmm. to, to save this country, your mm -hmm. last chance. Now, um, we also had a clip here that I want to play of Dick Durbin talking to uh, the FBI director, Christopher Wray, and he's discussing um, how you designate things, whether they are terrorism mm -hmm. or not. Let's listen to that. We are in a very tense moment in American history on the issue of race. We are having a national conversation that we haven't had in a long time about racism and the reaction, what's acceptable and what is not. 
And what I'm asking you from the FBI point of view and what you've told me is that we ought to take care as seriously as we take foreign inspired terrorism. There is a domestic terrorism underway in the name of race uh, that is as threatening in some respects as the foreign terrorism. That's the way I hear it. Yeah, I don't know that I, I, I think the greatest terrorist threat to the homeland is the homegrown violent extremists. I will say that this we would be take the best, foreign which, inspired, which is the hottest inspired you, violence. That does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that we don't take domestic terrorism, including hate crime committed on behalf of some kind of white supremacist ideology, extremely seriously. And we have had a number of very significant arrests. Uh, I mentioned the Coast Guard one, but we had militia members in Cleveland stockpiling explosives to build pipe bombs. We had the Cesar Sayoc case involving the package IED. We had uh, the Rise Above movement uh, where we uh, arrested eight different people on federal rioting charges. One of them fled to El Salvador and we got him back. We had the Tree of Life synagogue shooting case, which you mentioned, uh, and the shooting outside San Diego, the, uh, the attack in the synagogue there. Uh, we got a 29 count, I think it was, conviction and life sentence uh, related to the Charlottesville matter. So uh, make no mistake, the FBI working with our state and local uh, law enforcement partners is all over this. Okay, so you kind of get a feel for that there and what he is saying, Christopher Ray. That's the FBI director. Now let's listen to the president and his take on this, and we'll kind of talk about the difference between the two. Today, white nationalism is a rising threat around the world. I don't really. I think it's a uh, small group of people that have very, very serious problems. I guess if you look at what happened in New Zealand, perhaps that's a case. I don't know enough about it yet. They're just learning about the person and the people involved. But what's your take on, on where he's coming down on that? He's, he's being very consistent. Yes. You know, he's being very consistent. I mean, he still, he's, his position still is that the Central Park Five did not, um, that they actually raped Patricia and attacked Patricia merely, even though all the evidence showed it. And I was I was on the, the, the you know the um, I was one of the lawyers in terms of the, got their their sentence vacated and mm -hmm. the settlement. So he's very consistent. What he ignores is uh, Iman Jamil Abdul Alamin, who was formerly known as H. Rap Brown, when he was the head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, once said, "You know, violence is as American as cherry pie," and they, this. You know, the, the powers that be in the media don't want to deal with it. That's the nature of their, their existence, their arrival, and maintenance in this country has been the use of violence. And it's always been directed against uh, communities of color. And, so, and, and then sometimes it spills over into their own community. I think that's the reality that they, that they don't want to deal with. And that's the, that's the myth that Trump perpetuates. Yeah, I completely agree. And then I'll give it to him. He is anything but con like he is nothing but consistent. So from the very beginning, he has uh, had this platform, this hardline platform on we need to be tougher on immigration because uh, Hispanic and Mexicans are coming in and they're raping our women and they're taking our jobs. Uh, that th all of these ideals on this jihadist inspired extremism, even though we know that with data staring this administration in the face they still will, to this day, take up on that platform and say, no, this is where terrorism is coming from. And something that I do find interesting in his rhetoric is that he is very good about displacing what motivates certain individuals. So he begins talking about the New Zealand shooter, and he says, well, he has very serious problems, alluding to the fact that if you are a white perpetrator and you commit a mass shooting, or if you're involved in some sort of extremist incident, we need to look at the background of that person to try and understand, well, maybe there's some mental health issues going on. Maybe uh, it's something having to do with some sort of trauma that he experienced, that he or she experienced within as a child child or maybe they could have some sort of a uh, veteran uh, trauma as we he's have a, seen he's, he's a very troubled yeah he's a very yeah he's a bad apple of, that was uh, misunderstood but as you mentioned earlier if the perpetrator is black or brown oh no then we don't really care about what was going on a terrorist a is a terrorist is a terrorist it's a whole group and now we need to villainize the entire majority for the actions of one person ah, good discussion now we're going to take a short break and when we come back we'll get a little bit deeper into the debate over guns and gun violence as well as the push for common sense gun laws and the pushback against them this is let it rip 
watching CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Welcome back to Let It Rip. We're talking hate and guns with John Jay College adjunct professor Cillian Duran and human rights attorney and activist Roger Wareham. Mass shootings. It's a problem that instead of going away appears to be getting worse. 58 killed in Las Vegas in October of 2017 when Stephen Paddock opened fire on concert goers. 49 killed at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. 32 murdered at Virginia Tech. 27, including 20 children, killed at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Another 25 and an unborn child killed when a gunman opens fire at a small church in Sutherland Springs, Texas. In August, 22 killed in a mass shooting at a Walmart in El Paso. 17 killed at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. 14 killed in San Bernardino. 13 at Columbine High School. 12 in Virginia Beach. Another 12 at the Borderline Bar and Grill in Thousand Oaks, California. The list just goes on and on. 12 killed at a screening of a Batman film in Aurora, Colorado. 11 more at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. 10 at Santa Fe High School in Santa Fe, Texas. And Dylan Roof was convicted of killing nine African-American parishioners at a church in Charleston, South Carolina. These are just a few cases that left a lot of people dead and families shattered. Yet we can't seem to get gun control on the federal level. Why? Where this country is on gun control, I, tend, I started losing hope after Sandy Hook. Mm-hmm. And I think that is the norm, I think that's the normal, the normative conversation that we all have when we talk about guns. Um, I also, I agree, I don't understand why we need to have automatic weapons available. Everyone who says that it's for sport, there's only one particular sport that I can think of that you would need an assault rifle as a non-military civilian in the United States. Well, there's certainly a gun culture out there. I'm going to put up a tweet here. This is uh, Texas Governor Greg Abbott um, from a couple years ago, but he says, I'm embarrassed. Texas, number two in the nation for new gun purchases behind California? Let's pick up the pace, Texans. And they <laughs> tweeted that at the NRA. <laughs> I mean, it just goes on and on. Ted Cruz, gun control doesn't work. Look at Chicago. Disarming law-abiding citizens isn't the answer. Stopping violent criminals, prosecuting and getting them off the street before they commit more violent crimes is the most effective way to reduce murder rates. Let's protect our citizens. Right. They appeal, they appe- underline that is the appeal to racism and the view that uh, white folks are threatened by black people running around with guns or brown people running around with guns, mm-hmm. which, is, which is not the norm. And that most violence committed in the black community is against black people and in the brown community, it's against people that they know, as, as opposed to the, the type of uh, mass killings, just indiscriminate killings of strangers, which are committed, as uh, you know, Mr. Rand said, by, uh, you know, mainly white males. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are also taking issue with this whole argument that crimes are being committed with guns, but it's people who are mentally ill that are doing that. Let's listen to Donald Trump here uh, talk about that. (laughs) But people have to remember, however, that there is a mental illness problem that has to be dealt with. It's not the gun that pulls the trigger. It's the person holding the gun. What do you think of that? So let's let's take this into consideration. Now that we are seeing overwhelmingly white perpetrators holding guns, now we want to have a national conversation on the relationship between mental illness and all of these mass shootings. Okay, I'll give you that. Where was the same conversation in relation to the generational trauma that we experience as black and brown people in our communities. And everything that we take on that when we were talking about gun problems when they were in the hands of black and brown citizens. So why is it that it's a mental health problem for one group, but just uh, you are violent and need to be locked up and we need punitive punishments for another group? 
Dr. Megan Rainey, she says uh, this is just wrong to mm -hmm. go down that path. Right. The mass shootings that we're experiencing across the United States, the vast minority of them um, are committed by people with serious mental illness. Um, about 20% of Americans across the country suffer from mental illness, and as you mentioned, um, they are far more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators themselves. Where they're most at risk is risk of suicide. Um, as you said, two-thirds of gun deaths across this country are suicides, and by labeling mass shootings as mental illness, we risk further stigmatizing the mentally ill, driving them away from treatment, increasing the rates of suicide, and also preventing us from making forward progress on this epidemic. And in common conversation, you'll hear people say, oh, that guy must have been crazy, right? It seems, quote unquote, crazy to go and shoot a lot of people. Um, it's something that's been repeated over and over by the news media. About 40% of articles about mass shootings mention mental illness as a cause. It's something that we've come to believe as a nation, but the evidence does not support that link. It supports a link between substance use and mass shootings, a link between hatred and mass shootings, a link between prior violence and mass shootings, but not with mental illness. It's a diversion. It's a diversion to take the, the light off of its white supremacy, its organized, um, and once again, creating the atmosphere where folks know they have an out, you know, that, that you know, they can get away with it. So Trump is the... Uh, you know, the enabler in terms of the, the perpetuation of this and the continuation of this and saying that it's, it's all right. You know, that's when he said down at Charlottesville, well, there's people on both sides. He doesn't want to deal, he, he won't deal with, he won't address the question of that white nationalism is on the rise, that white nationalism is fascistic, that white nationalism is, is racist, and, uh, and that white nationalism is a convenient um, diversion from the, the, the nature of the economy uh, and its effects on, on, the, on the mass of people in the United States. We were at the United Nations World Conference Against Racism in 2001 to push the issue of recognition of the transatlantic slave trade and slavery as a crime against humanity and reparations. But the other part of that, of our argument was that you have to understand that there's an economic basis to racism. That racism doesn't just exist as an aberration, there's an economic basis to it, and when you want to find one, it's flaring up, it's tied to what's happening with the economy and its effect on people. And that's what Trump is, the front for, let's take our eyes off of that ball. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've noticed, though, is that, you know, 90% of the people in this country are for common sense gun control. And we're seeing that all over the place. People are saying, no, we want, want to do something about this problem. At the same time, you're starting to get uh, some support from businesses. Uh, Walmart stopped selling certain ammunitions, and they asked that people not carry in their stores. Kroger did the same thing, CVS, Wegmans. Um, all of those things are starting to happen at this point. What is your reaction to that? Do you, do you think that there's enough out there to move the Senate at this point, or do you think the NRA is just still too powerful? I mean, they tweeted at the NRA <laughs> saying we need to get our numbers up for, for gun sales in Texas, yeah. directly following a, a second mass shooting. Um, so I think that the unfortunate truth is that in our society, money talks walks and wields a lot of our policy that comes out of Washington. And with the NRA being the largest lobbying organization, it's going to be very difficult regardless of how many businesses, how many individuals come out. We, we're going to have to unfortunately come to some common ground, which in my probably pessimistic view, I do not see happening anytime soon. It's been a good discussion here. I enjoyed yeah, it. Thank, thank you, you both for coming in. Thank you. Ciliat Duran and Roger Wareham, thank you both. We're going to take you. another short break here, and I'll come back with some final thoughts. You're listening to Let It Rip. Now for some final thoughts. We've been talking about far-right extremism, violence, and guns in America. They're intertwined. And while the numbers of extremist attacks may not be greater than in years past, it does seem like we're hearing and seeing more from people who had operated in the shadows just a few years ago. And as far as mass shootings go, something has got to change. 
Just think for a moment about where you can go and not worry about your safety or an active shooter. The movies, no, they could shoot there. How about high school, no. A college campus, no. A concert, think Las Vegas, and that was a country music concert. Going to church or a synagogue, that would be safe, right? Absolutely not. It seems mass shootings have touched every corner of our lives, but at the federal level, not much seems to be getting done. To, at a minimum, enact laws that would require a background check to buy a gun or to ban assault-style weapons. It doesn't even seem like red flag laws will become the law of the land. There's a disconnect. The vast majority of Americans want common sense gun laws enacted, but so far the Senate has failed to act and follow the will of the people. Every time it looks like there could be some sort of movement, it appears lawmakers and the president cave to the pressures brought by special interest groups like the National Rifle Association. Little kids should be able to go to school and not worry about being shot. Grandmothers should be able to go to church and pray without worrying about gun violence. You should be able to go to a concert or a movie and not worry that someone with a gun and a grudge is going to open fire. It's time for lawmakers to do everything possible to make our lives safer. And that, I think, is the bottom line. Safety trumps a person's right to bear arms. All we're asking for is a little common sense. I'm Mike Gilliam. We'll see you next time on Let It Rip. 